In this tutorial, we will understand the structure of a JWT. We will see how a JWT is created, what the parts of the token are, and how you can construct and deconstruct a JWT yourself. We'll also look at some of the implications of this JWT structure and some of the resulting advantages and disadvantages of using JWTs for authorization, kind of as a direct result of how it's structured. A JWT is, in a sense, a JSON token, all right? If you aren't familiar with JWTs, I highly recommend you go check out this tutorial first before tackling this one. Go on, I'll wait. Okay, now that you know what the kind of problems that JWT is meant to solve, let's look at how JWT has been structured in order to solve those problems. Starting with understanding what JWT looks like. So here's a sample JWT doesn't really look like JSON, does it? It looks like a bunch of random characters. However, there are a few things that you can infer from this token that you're seeing on your screen, and this is what 99.999% of JWTs out there are gonna look like. First of all, notice that there are three different colors that this text is written in. It's kind of like you've split the token into three different parts. Most JWTs do have these three parts separated by period. Right, so you see this, there is one period over here, and then there is one period over here, which essentially separates this whole token into three different parts, and that's what these three colors are indicating. A typical JWT does consist of three parts. So you have the main part, the core, which is the payload, which is the JSON that you do need to exchange. This payload part is surrounded by two parts. There's one part at the top and one part at the bottom. The part at the top is called the header. And then there is a part at the bottom, which is the signature. The best way to understand the structure of JWT and to play with it is by going to this website called jwt.io. This is probably one of the first results you will get when you search for JWT on any search engine. The cool thing about jwt.io is this debugger section where you can actually play with JWT in real time. You can type in the encoded JWT and then it actually splits it into the three components, the header, the payload, and the signature, and it shows you those three components over here. And vice versa, you can change these values and have the encoded JWT be reflected. So this is a great place for us to kind of play with hands-on and understand uh, how a JWT is structured. JWT is a value token. The whole point of creating a JWT is to send some value from the server to the client so that the client can send it back on subsequent requests. So it's basically the server saying, hey, I've authenticated you, and here's the proof of me authenticating you. The next time you give me a request, I will have no idea who you are, so send me this token as a part of every request and I'll know who you are, right? So that's the whole point of a JWT. And the value that is being sent is the payload here, right? So let's say I authenticate on a website. The website says, okay, now I know that this user is Kaushik, so it creates a JSON payload with name is Kaushik. The ID is the ID in the system. And then this one is uh, issued at, uh, you can have more information here. So this one's tracking like, when was this token issued? You can have a bunch more information here. Nothing confidential, you don't wanna put something like a password here, but anything that lets you identify who that user is, you put it over here and the server sends it back. So the middle portion, the payload portion of the JWT is basically the data that you want to send encoded in base64, right? If you don't know, base64 encoding is a way for you to convert strings like this into characters, a string of characters which don't have some special characters or parentheses or braces or quotes like this, which make it very difficult to deal with in many languages. So this value, if I were to base64 decode it, I'm gonna get the payload and I can demonstrate this by going to one of the uh, many websites which let you do base64 encoding and decoding online. So I just pasted that encoded payload. Base64 decode is gonna give me the actual payload, all right? So that's the middle part of it. So there's the actual value you wanna send, base64 encoded, all right? Just this is not enough, right? You wanna have a signature because I can create this payload and say, my name is Bill Gates and send it to a web application. The web application shouldn't ideally trust us, right? Anybody can do this base64 encode and decode. Now the header 
and the signature is what lends authenticity to this JWT, all right? So the header tells how this is being signed. So the header is another JSON object, which has the type value, which says it's JWT, potentially to allow for any other types of tokens, which might come up in the future. And the algorithm tells what's the algorithm used to verify the signature, right? So this is another JSON object, and this is also base64 encoded and put on the header. Okay, so if I were to take this and convert it to a base64 decode, here you see I get that same object back, stripped off spaces as you can see here. So the header and the payload are both visible pretty much in plain sight, right? So anybody can take the first two portions and say, okay, this is the payload, this is the content that this JWT token contains, and this is the algorithm used for signing it. So the whole thing about converting JWTs into base64 encoded strings is just for convenience. It's not for hiding anything. Anybody can take a JWT and learn what the payload is. Now, the whole reason why we have a signature is not to encrypt or to decrypt the JWT. It is for the server to validate if this is actually correct, right? So here's what the server does. When somebody authenticates, it creates this payload, it creates this header algorithm, but then it figures out what the signature is. It signs this token by adding this string here, which only it can calculate. All right, so this string is possible to be computed only by the server that's issued the token. This is where the authenticity of the JWT comes into the picture. The server creates the signature and attaches it to the JWT and sends it back. The client, if it's a valid client, it just sends it as is and there is no problem there. But if there is a malicious client, they change the value here. Well, the signature is computed for the original value. It's no longer gonna match for this new value if I were to tamper with this thing. Well, the server is going to say, well, this signature is not the right signature for the value that you're sending me here. So this is not a valid JWT, all right? Now, how does it create the signature and how does it verify the signature? The signature is created using this algorithm here. Notice that this algorithm is the same as the algorithm value in the header. And this is what lets a single server possibly deal with multiple algorithms and multiple JWTs. They might say, well, hang on. If the algorithm is out in the open in the header, can someone else apply the same algorithm? and figure out the signature? Well, no, because this algorithm requires a secret key, which only the server has. And that's the reason why only the server can come up with the value, even though the algorithm used to compute the value is out in the open. This is what's referred to as a cryptographic hash. So the signature is calculated using something like this. It's doing a base64 URL encode of the header, which is basically this portion, plus dot, plus, base64 URL encode of the payload, which is this portion. So basically this value plus dot plus this value is gonna give you this portion of the JWT, all right? So it's gonna take this whole portion and it is going to sign it with a specific secret key. Let's say my secret key is secret, all right? It's going to sign this particular value with this key so that the value that's computed from this function, so the value that's resulting in this third portion, is really tied to the values over here. Now, if this were to change, this also has to change, okay? Now, a malicious user can change this, but they cannot change this because they need this secret to figure that out, all right? So this secret is gonna stay on the server. When the server is creating the JWT, it is going to put base64 encoding of the header, base 64 encoding of the payload, which anybody can do. But then the third portion is a signature which only the server can do, all right? So it gets that value, and then it computes it using this algorithm, and then it attaches it to the JWT. So this should give you an idea that a JWT is pretty much open. The value that the JWT contains is pretty much open, and the signature is only used to verify the authenticity of it. Kind of think of it as like a a certificate that you get, right? You get a certificate for something. Uh, you say your name has this accomplishment. It's visible for everybody to see. It's not hidden, it's not secure. But there is a signature at the bottom of the certificate which says, okay, I verify 
some authority verifies that the values in this certificate is valid. The information in the certificate is valid. So this is JWT. So this is what's created when authentication happens. And this is what the client sends back for every subsequent request. So let's look at the flow of how this is created and how this is exchanged. Now here's our client and here's a server. When the client authenticates with the server, the client uses whatever authentication mechanism, right? The user ID password, token-based authentication, possession-based authentication, whatever it is it gives some information, some proof that that user is who they say they are. The server says, okay, I've authenticated you. And now it creates a JWT for future authorization purposes. Remember, JWT is not for authentication. Authentication is done using whatever mechanism that identifies who the user is. JWT comes into the picture for further interactions. And the server says, okay, I've authenticated you. In order for me to remember who you are in a subsequent interaction, well, here is your JWT, which is why JWT is specific to authorization. A lot of people get this confused. People think that JWT is an authentication mechanism. Well, no, JWT comes into the picture only when the authentication is complete. Okay, now the server creates this JWT. It has this payload, puts a header there, and it signs it. The sign is strictly associated with the value as is. Now it sends it back. When the client gets that JWT, it can do one of multiple things. It can either hold on to it in local storage or it can hold on to it in a cookie. Doesn't matter. Whatever it uses to hold on to it, it has to pass it on every subsequent request. How does it pass it? It actually uses the HTTP header for it. HTTP headers are key value pairs. So the key for passing this, according to the JWT standard, is called authorization. And the value is the word pairer followed by a space, followed by the JWT. So the client on every subsequent request puts this in the header and sends it to the server. The server examines the request, checks this value in the header. It says, okay, the authorization, I have the JWT. Now it splits it into these three parts. It figures out what the payload is. It doesn't need to do any other processing for it. All it has to do is to get the middle part and do base64 decode. It has the value already but it just doesn't take it. It has to verify if this is valid. So what it does is it follows this formula. It does a base64 encode of the header and dot then base64 encode of the payload, which is basically this portion of the JWT. And then it calculates the signature for it and verifies if it matches with the signature that it sent. If it matches, then it trusts that this is the JWT that it sent. If it doesn't match, well, then it has its own error mechanism where it says, okay, now this is a tampered JWT. I don't trust you and I don't let you in. Okay. Now, this brings up a bunch of questions. First of all, the value in the JWT is out in the open. So how secure is this? There are a bunch of things you have to think about. Like I mentioned before, you don't want to have any confidential information there. Like for example, you don't want to have the password. You don't want to have the user's social security number or tax ID or bird date or anything like that. You just need just enough information for the server to know who that person is, all right, to establish the principle on the server. Second concern, the signature is tied to the contents of the JWT, so the JWT cannot be tampered, which is great. But now, what if somebody else gets hold of my JWT and sends it in the request? They can impersonate as me, right? The server is just verifying the authenticity of the JWT it is not actually tying it to a specific user because the whole point of JWT is to not remember anything else. It's to just go off of the value that is sent. So if I can send this JWT and get authorization, someone else can steal my JWT, put it into the header the exact same way and get authorized. Wouldn't that work? Well, yes, technically it will work, which is why you have to be careful about how you're transmitting JWT. It has to be in an HTTPS connection and then it has to be in conjunction with a bunch of other established authentication and authorization mechanism. One very common way of using JWT is using the process of OAuth for authenticating and authorizing. And OAuth comes with its own security protections to make sure that people don't steal JWTs. All right, the third challenge with JWT and the, possibly the disadvantage of JWT is this. When compared to session-based authentication, now let's say somebody does steal 
your JWT. What can you do about it? In the case of session IDs, let's say somebody knows that your session ID is stolen. Like I'm authenticated with the server and I realize that someone else has stolen my session ID. I can log off, right? It ends the session and that session doesn't exist anymore. Sessions can expire or sessions can be terminated when there is a need to do so. What about JWTs? There is nothing on the server to end. The whole information is inside the JWT. You can, of course, set up expiration for JWTs, right? So we learned how you can have any payload. You can have uh, issued at payload. You can have expiration payloads. And you can say, okay, when the JWT is returned from the client and it's already expired, the server doesn't have to honor it, which is fine. But how do you log off something? Well, the way to do this in JWT is a little bit tricky. Since there is nothing to end on the server, the way people handle it is by having some blacklisted JWTs. So let's say the server issues me a JWT and I tell the server, hey, somebody has stolen my JWT. Well, what the server can do is maintain state on the server, maintain a list of blacklisted JWTs and say, okay, this particular JWT is blacklisted. So when somebody tries to access with that JWT, it compares with this blacklist and says, okay, is this JWT among the list that has been blacklisted in which case don't authorize this, right? So it's a workaround and it's not ideal, but this is also another disadvantage of JWTs. So in this tutorial, we learned how JWT is structured, how it's exchanged between the client and the server, and some of the disadvantages, including the visibility, it's not private, and how you handle stealing or expiry of JWT tokens. What you saw using an online interface at JWT.io can be done using libraries in a bunch of different languages. You have JWT libraries for Java, JWT libraries for JavaScript, Python. You can use those libraries to give a payload and a header and then calculate the whole JWT out of it. The next question is, how do you implement JWT-based authentication and authorization in a web application? How does the end-to-end -end flow work? So check out this tutorial where I walk through the concepts that we have learned so far, and we actually implement it in a Java Spring application. So check this out, and I'll see you there.